right. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the Taria Hall Pittman Social Justice Series. This month, we're celebrating the legacy of the rainbow sign. While it lasted, the rainbow sign was Berkeley's Black Cultural Arts Center, a place where artists and activists converged to form a vibrant community invested in honoring the past and building faith in the future. Rainbow Sign from 1971 to 1977 hosted talks by James Baldwin, concerts by Nina Simone, exhibits of world-class black art and civic meetings with everyone from the Black Panthers to Warren Widener, Berkeley's first black mayor. The center served as an inspiration to vice president elect, Madam Kamala Harris, who called her family's visits a citizen's upbringing. Our discussion will feature stories from participants and archival images and a Q&A will follow. Friendly reminder, this event is being recorded and chat has been turned off. If you have any questions for the panelists, post them in the Q&A box. We'll answer as many as we can at the end of the program. You can follow us at berkeleypubliclibrary.org on Instagram and Facebook. All right, so I'm Juan again here at the Taria Hall Pittman South Branch and I'm happy to be presenting um, the legacy of the rainbow sign. Um, this program is part of the Taria Hall Pittman Social Justice Series. The series honors the legacy of Ms. Pittman's social justice activism that positively affected the lives of people in California. Programming topics and formats are diverse, but the goal of each event is to bring awareness and promote discussions related to human rights, social privilege, and equal opportunity. Before we get started, just want to thank the friends and the foundation of the Berkeley Public Library for their support of Berkeley Public Library programming. After the event, please take time to send us your feedback by taking a short online survey. Also, please subscribe to the library's social media feeds on Instagram and Facebook, where you'll get announcements to great events like this and receive updates about the library. Okay, just a couple of house, house rules. Uh, this event is being recorded and may be available via one of the library's social media channels. Please be aware that we are recording. Feel free to exit this event anytime. And now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Tessa Risachar. <laughs> I know I was gonna mess that up. <laughs> Risacker, Risacker. Got it, no worries. Right. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Juan, I really appreciate it. And thank you to Dan Berengeli at the Berkeley Library for helping to put this together. I want to thank um, Greg Castillo and Scott Saul as well for their input in creating uh, our, product, our presentation this evening. Um, for me, I uh, came to this work through a class taught by Professor Scott Saul at UC Berkeley, which um, it's, oh, I wrote something down and I'm nervous, so I'm going to read from my notes, <laughs> which is on Berkeley in the 1970s, and it encourage students to seek local untold stories and then build a digital archive of documents that would help tell them. So following a tip from Michael Kramer, who is a historian working on the Berkeley Folk Music Festival and who had created a similar digital archive, my research partner Max Lopez and I um, started looking into the Rainbow Sign, a club run by folk music promoter Marianne Poller. And when we looked on the internet, there was very little about it. Um, we started to pull things together, looking at what we could find from the periodical record, newspaper articles, and we contacted Odette Poller, who uh, was gracious enough to let us into her home and into boxes of ephemera and papers that her parents had saved about this club. And through all of that, we built our project for the website, which you can check out, and I'll drop the link in the chat at some point as well, at revolution.berkeley.edu. Um, and after we built that website, I've 
couldn't get over how incredible this place was and how much more there was to, to think about it and to write about it. And uh, so I kept studying that through the rest of my term at Cal. I did two theses on it. Um, and Professor Scott Saul was my advisor for both of those and has been incredibly supportive throughout all of that. Um, we've written a couple articles about it since then. Um, and it just continues to, to amaze. Um, so I also want to express my gratitude to all the people who granted me interviews to help me tell this story. Um, Electra Price, Charles Brown, E.J. Montgomery, our panelists here tonight, Eugene Redmond and Halifa Osumari and Desi Woods-Jones, uh, Ishmael Reed. Um, all of these people were very generous with their time and stories and I'm so grateful um, to be able to be doing this work. Um, and of course, Incredible, huge thanks again to Odette Poller for trusting me with her parents' memory. Um, so to kick things off, I would like to start introducing our panelists. Um, first up is Halifu Osumari. Halifu is Professor Emerita. Welcome, Halifu. Um, Professor Emerita of African American and African Studies at California University Davis, University of California Davis. She's been a dancer, choreographer, arts administrator, and a scholar of Black popular culture for over 50 years, with a career that has taken her across the globe. She holds a PhD in American Studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and a master's in dance ethnology from San Francisco State. A protege of the late renowned dancer anthropologist Catherine Dunham, she is a certified instructor of Dunham Dance Technique. Dr. Osumari is author of The Africanist Aesthetic in Global Hip Hop, Power Moves, and The Hip Life in Ghana, West African Indigenization of Hip Hop. In 2018, she published her autobiography, Dancing in Blackness, a memoir, which won the 2019 Selma Jean Cohen Prize in Dance Aesthetics and the American Book Award. In chapter four, she talks about the early 1970s, leaving her position as a soloist with the Rod Rogers Dance Company in New York and returning to the Bay Area to hone her choreographic style, which is where Rainbow Sign and Entezaki Shanghai come in. More on that, I hope. Osumari founded Everybody's Creative Arts Center in Oakland in 1977 and over the next decade helped it evolve into City Center Dance Theater. Between 1989 and 1995, she founded and led the National Dance Initiative Black Choreographers Moving Toward the 21st Century. Since retiring from UC Davis in 2016, Dr. Osumari has returned to dance theater, choreographing the Sacramento State University dancers with In the Eye of the Storm and Resistance slash Resilience, a vision of the socio-political and spiritual crisis of the new civil rights movement, Black Lives Matter. In 2020, Dr. Osumari won the Dance Studies Association Distinction in Dance Award for Lifetime Achievement in Performance, Scholarship, and Service to Dance. Like her mentor, Catherine Dunham, she has dedicated her life to the intersection of the arts and humanities for a better world. Mm. Thank you. Professor Dr. Eugene B. Redmond is Poet Laureate of East St. Louis, Illinois and the founding editor of Drum Voices Review. He is an emeritus professor of English and former chairman of the Creative Writing Committee at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Redmond is the author editor of 25 volumes of poetry, collections of diverse writings, plays for stage and TV, posthumously published works of Henry Dumas. He was named Poet Laureate of East St. Louis in 1976, the year Doubleday released his best-selling book, Drum Voices, The Mission of Afro-American Afro Poetry. Prior to that, from 1967 to 1969, he spent two years as a teacher counselor and poet in residence at Southern Illinois University's Experiment in Higher Education, where he taught with Catherine Dunham. From 1970 to 1985, he was professor of English and poet in residence at the California State University, Sacramento. During that time, he won an NEA Creative Writing Fellowship, an Outstanding Faculty Research Award, and a Pushcart Prize Best of the Small Presses. He served as a visiting professor at universities across the US, Africa, and Europe. And during that time, he frequently uh, visited Rainbow Sign. A longtime friend of Maya Angelou, Redmond read a poem at her 70th birthday gala hosted by Oprah Winfrey in 1998. His photo exhibit, 80 Moods of Maya, was featured at her 80th birthday party in 2008. 
Also in 2008, Redmond received an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters degree from Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. He has also won an American Book Award for The Eye in the Ceiling, the Sterling Brown Award from the African American Literature and Culture Association, a Staying the Course Award from English Teachers Association of Chicago, and the St. Louis American Foundation's Lifetime Achievement Award. All right, a quick sip of water. The Honorable Desi Woods Jones is former mayor of, excuse me, is a former member of the Oakland City Council from 1991, <laughs> and she served as vice mayor of Oakland from 1996 to 1997. She was the first woman to run for mayor of Oakland. Professionally, for over 34 years, Ms. Woods-Jones worked for the Peralta Community College District in various leadership roles and retired as the Assistant Chancellor for External Affairs in 2002. She holds yeah. an honorary PhD in Public Administration from California State University, Hayward. Her history of civic involvement goes back a long time. She spent many years working in the civil rights movement with organizations such as CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, BCPC, the Black Conference Planning Committee, and SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She had the pleasure of working with many well-known civil rights leaders, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Stokely Carmichael, later Kwame Ture, Julian Bond, and numerous others. In the mid-60s, Desi moved from California to Atlanta, Georgia, where she worked throughout the South doing voter registration and taking part in sit-ins and national marches for social justice. Desi is a founding member and state president of Black Women Organized for Political Action, BAWAPA, the oldest such organization in California, and one which made Rainbow Sign its headquarters throughout the 70s. Desi has served as BAWAPA's president for over 50 years, helping to elect leaders such as Ella Hill Hutch, Diane Watson, Teresa Hughes, Maxine Waters, Barbara Lee, Kamala Harris, and many more. She is the president and CEO of DWJ and Associates, consulting firm that specializes in public affairs, governmental relations, leadership training, civic engagement, and event planning. DWJ clients have included the National Black Caucus Foundation, AC Public Affairs, the Ramsey Group, the Peralta Community College District, Fresno Unified School District, and the City of Oakland, among others. And we are also very blessed to have Odette Poller here. Uh, who is, yes, the daughter of Marianne and Henry Pollard, but very accomplished in her own right as well. She is the founder of the Oakland nonprofit, The Plant Exchange, which she started in her front yard in 2007, and which has become the premier plant exchange on the West Coast. In March and October each year, over a thousand participants trade many thousands of plants, as well as tools, equipment, and knowledge, building community, facilitating new green projects, and new plant exchanges across the country. Odette is a nationally acclaimed author, newspaper columnist, speaker, trainer, and business process improvement consultant. She's written five books on workplace issues, and she wrote the nationally syndicated newspaper column, Smart Ways to Work. Mm -hmm. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. All right, moving right along. Um, I'm going to share a slideshow that I put together about Rainbow Sign, and then after that, we will move into the conversation. Um, just a warning, I'm going to be going through these really quickly, but this is being recorded and is going to be up on YouTube, so if there's images folks want to spend more time with, that is a possibility later on, and I also really encourage everybody to check out the website at uh, Berkeley Revolution excuse me, revolution.berkeley.edu, where you can uh, pour over a lot of these documents um, that again, Odette Pollard was gracious mm. to share with us for this project. So I'm gonna switch over to the screen share here. All right. It all begins with Marianne Poller. In 1950, Marianne Poller and her husband Henry moved to Oakland where they became involved in the folk music scene and where they befriended the folk singer Odetta. In 1958, Odetta's manager reached out to the Pollers about presenting a concert in Berkeley, which they did, and which was such a success they decided to incorporate into a fully fledged production company, Marianne Poller Presents. 
Throughout the 60s, Mary Ann Pollard presented folk artists such as Joan Baez, Pete Seeger, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Simon and Garfunkel, but no concert would change her fortunes as dramatically as the chance she took on an up-and-comer named Bob Dylan in 1964, bringing him to the Bay Area, or to the West Coast for the very first time. After Dylan, Pollard's reputation grew and she continued to be very successful throughout the 60s and 70s, producing concerts for everyone from Arlo Guthrie to Frank Zappa. Here's just a partial list of the artists she presented. Most of these shows took place at very large and sometimes outdoor venues. And after a while, she began to get weary of the music biz and concert culture and long for a place of her own where she could present emerging artists. More than just a venue, Marianne Pollard envisioned a total cultural center that would incorporate different disciplines with a focus on education, civic engagement, and a crack and good bar restaurant in the middle of it. And all of it would be black oriented. By 1970, the black arts movement and the black power movement were well underway and the Pollers wanted to lend their skills and capabilities to the cause in the way that only they could, which was by creating this unique club and while it was to be black oriented, it was not black only. Its offerings would be open to everyone. When it came time to name the center, Marianne Pollard turned to the spiritual, Oh Mary, don't you weep, which has the line, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time, which is, of course, used by James Baldwin in his 1964 book. It's very possible that James Baldwin and Mary Ann Pollard talked about the naming of the center because they were actually good friends. These photos were taken of them at a rainbow sign event in 1976. To build her center, Mary Ann Pollard put together a team of other black women in their 30s and 40s, women who were leaders in journalism like Edith Austin and Belva Davis and leaders in education like Electra Price and Mary Jane Johnson. And they sought to provide a cultural home in the Black community that would involve the Black community in art and involve the art community in Black art, all with a focus on the next generation. And while the women were central to this, the men put in a lot of work as well, especially Henry Poller and Charles Brown, Marianne Poller's assistant and the front of house coordinator. For a location, they chose this 1920s funeral home located on Derby and Grove Street in Berkeley. Grove Street, now Martin Luther King Jr. Way, is significant as the residential red line that divided Oakland and Berkeley uh, the, in this period, deciding where Blacks could and could not buy property. You can also see the border with Oakland and Emeryville in yellow here. Renovating the mortuary took a lot of work, but it paid off and they had a beautiful space as you can see here. This is a, a look of onto the program hall up into the organ loft, the dining room, commercial kitchen, club room, uh, the office, and the floor plan here. Lots of amenities, including air conditioning, which not many buildings had at that point. These photos were taken in 2017. This is a view from the organ loft, looking out to the hall. To lead the art gallery, Marianne Pollard tapped a woman named E.J. Montgomery, who is an artist and who worked at the Oakland Museum as a black art consultant. Under Montgomery's direction, an incredible roster of artists came to Rainbow Sign, some of them listed here. Just a few highlights, Afra Cobra came out from Chicago to their first Northern California visit to show at Rainbow Sign. Elizabeth Catlett, printmaker, sculptor, and expat living in Mexico City would come up to do shows exclusively at Rainbow Sign. And this piece created by Betty Saar, uh, especially for a Rainbow Sign exhibit was hailed by Angela Davis as the piece that sparked the black women's movement. And this is the invitation for that show. And all of these um, efforts were made to bring people into the gallery who had never been in an art gallery before, um, to make prints and other things available at prices people could afford and to get people interested and involved. Uh, events like this um, were often seen where you would have a multimodal uh, bill of fare uh, with writers and artists and 
you know, engineers and architects. This is one of the first times you see Man Maya Angelou showing up at Rainbow Sun in an official capacity, but she was there all the time. It was one of her places. Charles Brown remembers seeing her there constantly. Um, she also chose to do readings and release parties for these two books of poetry there. Maya Angelou was the person who introduced Eugene Redmond to Rainbow Sign, and he came in 1972 to give a reading from this book. He also organized an awushio or praise song of Henry Dumas in 1975, where he brought this list of uh, local writers to read pieces of Dumas' work. Uh, among them were Ishmael Reed and Tazaki Shanghe and a young Terry McMillan who would later write a thank you letter to Marianne Pollard saying what a great time she had at her first ever poetry reading. Uh, Eugene Redmond also worked on Giant Talk and um, see Jane Cortez is reading here as well. I know he was there for the Guinness World Record Poetry Reading, which happened in July of 75 and lasted six days and nights, featuring 263 poets, including Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Bob Kaufman, and Joyce Carol Thomas. And there was also readings for Alice Walker, Rosa Guy, James Baldwin, and Huey Newton. This was organized by Barbara Lee while she was president of the Black Student Union. And in addition to these sort of book parties, there was also a clearinghouse for chapbooks, latest issues of journals, um, things like that. Sarah Webster Fabio, the poet and educator, wrote a seven volume series of chapbooks called Rainbow Sign, which she premiered at Rainbow Sign in 1974. Moving on to performing arts, Odetta was a fixture at the center. She played the opening and many benefit concerts throughout. Nina Simone played there in 1972, uh, at which point the mayor also declared March 31st Nina Simone Day in Berkeley. It was a hotspot for jazz with people like Bobby Hutcherson, John Handy, Michael White, James Turk playing, uh, Taj Mahal, Kenny Burrell, um, as well as Oscar Brown Jr. and Abby Lincoln, all were guest artists in residence, which meant that in addition to performing, they also offered workshops to the community all week long. Uh, it was a place where celebrities would stop by. It was a place where there was film screenings. So William Marshall was there touring for Blackula. Paul Winfield and Cicely Tyson came for Sounder. Um, athletes like Mudkite Grant, Whitman Mayo uh, came to talk at a conference of Black theater. And there was a lot of dance performances and short play festivals held there. It was importantly the site for Halifu Osumari's premiere of her play for women, images of the Black woman in monologue, poetry, song, and dance written up here in the Black Panther newspaper. This play was uh, the first time Endazaki Shanghai had ever been on stage as an actor, and it was an important forerunner to her um, choreo poem for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, which she debuted in 1976. Halifu also taught dance at Rainbow Sign, so you can see from these wonderful photographs. In addition to dance, there was classes held on a number of other topics and many lectures as well. And these were organized towards adults, but also towards children who remained at the center of Rainbow Signs mission. In this letter, you can see a high school student thanking Marianne Poller and Bawapa for helping her to reach her graduation. I'll bring your book back, she says. Uh, so Bawapa was incredibly influential at this time period and beyond and was at Rainbow Sign uh, throughout. Indeed, many of the women who founded Bawapa were also original sponsors of Rainbow Sign. And through, they started helping to elect people like Ronald Dellums, Lionel Wilson, and Warren Widener. And as the 70s wore on, they started to shift their focus to training and electing Black women, uh, realizing that they needed to be having a seat at the table as well. And I hope Desi will share the story of the meeting at Rainbow Sign uh, that uh, kicked off that for them. They were, Boapa was responsible for bringing Shirley Chisholm to Rainbow Sign in 1971. And they brought Josephine Baker for a luncheon in 1973. Um, many municipal government oriented uh, or community oriented meetings were held at Rainbow Sign because people 
actually would go to them as opposed to City Hall. And it was a site where Warren Widener held this nationwide conference of black mayors, also supported by Boapa, I believe, uh, in 1973. And it was a place where uh, people would bring important visiting guests, African dignitaries and US leaders and all sorts of folks like that. And meanwhile, the rentable conference rooms were available throughout. So all manner of organizations, Jewish community groups, American Indian groups, uh, everyone was meeting at Rainbow Sign under the same roof. Um, and that all began with Marianne Pollard. All right, how do I get out of my share? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Tessa, yes, I just have to say that was absolutely incredible. Thank yes. you so much for putting that overview of the rainbow sign together. It was incredible. Thank you. That means a lot. Yes, yes. Amen. A woman. Yes, <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. As Sonia Sanchez would say. <laughs> we not only second that, but we third it as well. And thank you, Odette, for just being such a wonderful supporter of this project. So we'll, yes. I know we'll get into more of that later. Thank yeah. you. Great. All stunning, right. Stunning. Stunning. Thank you so much. I guess the book is on its way, right, Odette <laughs> and Tessa? Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, so let's get into the conversation. I have you all here. It's so wonderful. And yes, you know, I've spent a lot of time with these documents and I have, you know, all these factoids in my, in my brain and chronologies and, and things like that, but I wasn't there. You all were. So I, I would love to just hear you talk about it. Um, and the first question is, is just that, you know, what, what made rainbow sign special? What did it, what did it give you? What did it give the community? What, what was it for you? Do you want to go in a certain order or should we just jump in, I Tessa? Just jumping in works. Um, if, if, if you feel like you'd like me to go one by one, I can. But if you're moved to speak, I think. I think you got, a lot of talk. Yeah. you got a lot of talkers here. So if you think we're talking too much, you let us know. But I'll, I'll, I'll gladly start. Sure. Because I think a couple of things that you said uh, in the overview, which I think was so profound, uh, it really wasn't just a cultural center for Berkeley. Uh, as a resident, longtime resident of Oakland, and very active in, of course, Bay Area culture and politics, it really was the cultural center for the Bay Area, not only the East Bay, but the Bay Area. And it was so wonderful to have uh, that center, to have that vision of someone uh, that uh, opened up and saw that where this intersection of activists in our communities was what was so what was so moving and so encouraging to all of us because we could go to the rainbow sign and not only could you interact by happened to my piece of that was primarily on the political arena, but there was the artists, there were the, uh, you know, the cultural part of it, there was the singers, the dancers, it, it just drew an intersect of such phenomenally talented, creative people. And, and saying that, Alifo, I just have to remember, girl, I remember when you look like that, and I know you still move like that as the years go past, but uh, I recall again just her her tremendous talent, and it brings back all of this history memories, memories where we were training others and encouraging others and having, you know, all of these folks that are on, like Lou Jean, Jean who came through. And my goodness, uh, Tessa, and I'll, I'll shut up after this, but when you showed the picture of, again, um, not only um, uh, Shirley Chisholm, uh, but also when you show the picture of Josephine Baker, you know, my heart leaped. And one of my favorite uh, uh, photographs I have of, of, again, Josephine Baker was taken with my son, who was about two years old at the time, and uh, my nephew, and it was taken at the rainbow sign. So th there is just such a lot of not only um, the activities and the history, but the joy, the joy of experiencing a place like that where we could come and laugh and discuss and strategize and organize and all the things that we did there. But in the midst of all of this, we could eat good food, have a good time and enjoy one another's company from the intellectual activist community in the Bay Area. So I, I just kind of wanted to start with that. And uh, we could talk a little bit more about Bo Wapo later, but that's my overview. That's great. 
and 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 I would say as a as a performing artist from the performing artist perspective, we always felt that the rainbow sign was open to us that we could go there with our projects, with our ideas, with our um, creativity, and Marianne Pollard would be willing to listen and to entertain our proposals. And so when when I came back from uh, after five years of being away from the Bay Area, living in Europe for three years, dancing in New York and in Boston, and really wanting to establish myself again in my home area in 1973, uh, I had heard about the rainbow sign. I went there and immediately Marianne welcomed me and, and my, my partner at, at that time, uh, Nana Maynard, now called Sananda Ananda Maynard, and we presented her with a proposal to present my play for women. Um, she, when she found out I was a choreographer and a dancer, she immediately said, well, don't you want to teach dance classes too? And that brought a whole lot of dancers into the center, I think really for the first time. And it was that front room that we saw in some of those pictures where we held our classes. And we, I would say that it was at least, um, we would have at least 25 to 30 young dancers eager to learn this new form that we call Afro jazz, <laughs> whatever that was at the time. Um, and Wait, I, just art, have to say, I thought I could do that back in the day and I did it a little bit, but never as good as you. <laughs> and, and with live drumming. So uh, that brought in a new kind of life that, that you know, dance with live music can only do. So when we, when we actually presented my play, and that was really one of my first and only theatrical plays with a script, uh, live musicians, uh, dancers, me, and, and actors and singers. It was called Four Women, Images of the Black Woman and Monologue, Song and Dance. And as you said before, Endozaki Shange was in it. Uh, I had to work hard with her because she was a, a brilliant writer but she was just testing the waters as an, as an actor and a performer. And we brought it out. And Rainbow Sign was really one of her first areas where she knew she began to see that she could be an actor as well as a writer. And as they say, the rest is history. She left the, uh, she left the Bay Area, went back to her home area of New York and, you know, uh, within a year was on Broadway with For Color Girls Who Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Enough. But Rainbow Sign and the welcoming tradition that Marianne and Henry established allowed uh, us to present our work, to test it out, and to let that serve as a platform for us to continue our careers. And I will always be grateful for her for that as well as many other Bay Area artists. Hmm. Well, I, I want to say that um, there's so many um, avenues into Rainbow Sign and out of Rainbow Sign. And there's so many things uh, that Rainbow Sign parallel. There's so many correspondences as I think about rainbow sign and so many um, correlatives. Um, I think of rainbow sign as extremely welcoming for people, for artists. And the artists, all artists, writers, poets, musicians, visual artists, dancers got their start there. Like you mentioned, you know, Entezaki. And I remember when Entezaki, who was Paulette Williams. Yes. Was in East St. Louis. Her father was at the only place where, or one of the two places where doc, where black physicians could intern. And it was Homer G. Phillips Hospital in St. Louis. She came as Paulette Williams across the Mississippi River to East St. Louis, Illinois, 
to observe Dunham. She never uh, danced, she just sat and watched. And um, it's like a young girl. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then she, you know, they moved and, and, and went east. And then the next time I encountered her was at Rainbow Sign. And she was then into Zaki Shange. And Ishmael Reed and Clyde Taylor. Clyde Taylor was and is my mentor. He was at at Howard with um, Amiri and Tony Morris. You know, we have to hook all this stuff in. <laughs> anyway, uh, they recommended her to read from Henry Duma at the Awushu that we saw in the video or in the, yeah, in the video. Um, and then I, I got to know her again as Entezaki, Entezaki Shange. And of course we did other things over time, collaborated on various things. But I, uh, and I could go on naming people. Uh, I'm not sure that that Mary Ann and her husband saw Danny Glover, but he went there once. Danny was a student over at uh, ACT. San Francisco? Yes. I don't know if there are pictures. I don't know if there are pictures, uh, Tessa, but people who were encouraged by Rainbow Sign, all the dignitaries that you mentioned, the African dignitaries, all the people who, if you came to the Bay Area and you were with someone who was conscious, then you had to visit the rainbow sign. I brought uh, Jane Cortez there. I brought her husband, the great sculptor, uh, Mel Edwards there. Uh, we brought a, a steady stream of artists of all uh, genres to Sacramento. And invariably, before they left, got on a plane in Sacramento going back, we, we, we brought them to uh, Berkeley, to Absolutely. the rainbow sign. So I think, they, uh, I think a welcoming ground, you know, the, it was something about Marion Pollard that That's she could, my next question. She could yeah. attract everybody. Mm -hmm. She could attract everybody and then she yes. stepped out of the way. Yes. Yep. I would yeah. I would agree with that completely. She, she, that she attracted mom. everybody there and you knew she was in charge. You knew she was back there doing something, getting something ready. But what she did was she, uh, you know, Bessie Smith used to say, put the light on me, baby, put the light on me. Well, that that wasn't what Mary Ann Paula, it wasn't her approach. And of course she wasn't a singer either. But those are some of my, my thoughts about it is that, that welcoming, uh, arena for everybody and anybody who was either conscious uh, of art, a patron, or who was him or herself striving to be an artist felt that they were at home the minute they stepped inside that place. Yes. Um, Eugene? Mm -hmm. Eugene? Yes. So let me show you, tell you a story on the other side. So you're talking okay. about artists and people wanting to move yeah. to the next step in their career. So here's the other side of this. My dad <laughs> managed basically everything. So he was working full time and then he would come home, change clothes and go straight to rainbow sign. But one of the things he paid attention to what was what was going on in the kitchen. And so they brought in young kids to work, to learn how to um, work to do a full day's work, to if it was waiting tables or if it was doing something else. But I ran into a guy who worked at Rainbow Sign, I don't know, five or six years ago, recognized me, started talking about my parents, my dad specifically, because my dad taught him to wait tables, he ended up being in charge of all of the catering for Claremont Hotel and Resort. 
-hmm. And he ties mm -hmm. it directly back to my dad, right? And learning and my dad saying, no, this is the way it is done correctly and giving people a chance. So it was not just artists and performers. It was the average person walking in off the street who got to see and be around these folks or learn a craft or learn a trade. And um, that was definitely my parents. They were both very welcoming. That's a really good description, but I'll turn it back to you, Tessa. <laughs> to add to that, I remember Charles Brown, who um, you know also worked with people in the front of house and in the kitchen, um, telling me that the people, many of the people who he staffed Rainbow Sign with, were recently paroled from San Quentin, and so it was like a first step getting them a job as well, and and that he was very proud uh, to connect with them later in life as in what as well and see what their careers had. You know, one of them was running a kitchen and, and different things like that. Yep. Well, it's a great segue into my next question, which is, what was it about Maryam Poller? What was it, um, and Henry Poller, uh, that that made this possible? Like, how? What was it that made her special? Her worldview, or soul, or experience? What? Well, I, I'll, I'll start. I just remember first time walking into Rainbow Sign and the smile that I received. <laughs> she had the best uh -huh. smile on the I planet. Know, just the uh -huh. smile. You know, immediately the smile told you everything. Mm -hmm. It said, come right in. We are open to you. So many places you go, you feel like you have to figure out a way to enter and to be accepted. And when you, the, when you crossed over that threshold and rainbow sign and you met with Marianne, that smile immediately told you everything that you needed to know. That's a good description. <laughs> and uh, you, you yeah, know, yeah, I agree. It, I it, agree 300% with that. It, it was the smile that let you know that number one, she was in charge, but number oh, yeah. two, <laughs> she, was, yeah. she, she was open <laughs> to listening to you. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and I think to add to what you said to her, but it wasn't only, you know, absolutely the smile. She was welcoming, she was warm, but she was so charismatic. And I, I want to come mm -hmm, back to something mm -hmm. like, you know, Dennis said, it was like, when you came in there, you know, you were in a place and you knew it was, again, as I said earlier, warm, joyful, uh, entertaining, but it was never, even though you knew who was in charge, as you said, you never felt like she was managing you. You never felt, again, uncomfortable. You never felt an overhanded. Some people, you know, when you go into their places of mm -hmm. business, or, mm -hmm. you know, they, they want you to know, you know, now this is my place and I'm in charge. And you, you never felt that when you went to the rainbow side. It, again, was just such a, always not only welcoming, but you felt a sense of a place to, that you wanted to be. And she was, again, uh, just, I mean, she was just a wonderful person to be around. She was just so charismatic. You wanted to be around her. You wanted to be in that presence. So uh, I think those are some of the things that not only, but I, I think more than that, she and Henry obviously created in their vision and wisdom, and I don't want to underestimate or state this, they found a way to build this connection of, again, a united group of people from the Bay Area. It wasn't set aside just as a music club. And I think that's just profound. It wasn't set aside just yeah. as a performing art center. It wasn't set aside. It really was a place for all that felt a sense of being engaged and involved and in looking for change. I mean, think about the time we were into this. This was really a, a tremendous time for change in our country in terms of the civil rights movement. So uh, mm -hmm. you know, we were making changes again in elected offices. We were making change. And, and but so she, they, they somehow built a place, a community center that all felt welcome. And that's, I just think, you know, how many places do we have uh, that kind of have emulated that uh, that sense of place for us today. I mean, I, I just think it was a phenomenal vision and so creative for both of them to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 a, real, a real business. Uh, I mean, a, a real business woman. I mean, she she knew business inside out, and I think uh, you know from 
that that incredible track record of having brought in all those um, great artists from mainstream America, some of, of whom were not so mainstream because they were like revolutionary. I mean, kind of, uh, you know, Bob Dylan wasn't initially seen as mainstream, you know, at first. And she produced and promoted all those people. <clears throat> initially, mostly uh, European American and Jewish artists. And uh, I did have a, a question later regarding her move to this uh, the black cultural component, not that she wasn't always doing it, but the way she moved exclusively toward, uh, toward the black, I mean, civil rights and the black arts movement, black power movement, the Panthers, of course, she welcomed them. But I had a question uh, for, for that. I can ask it later. Uh, okay, you know. we can talk uh, later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, I have a, a point that I want to make about the model that I saw for um, Rainbow Sign, because to me, what it said was, we set a black table, but everybody is welcome to, mm -hmm. to partake. And when I started my institution in 1977, um, I follow that model, everybody's creative arts center. Yes. Uh, when, when we set our curriculum for that center, um, we said, basically, we set a black table in the arts, but everybody is welcome. And I okay. feel like I had the, um, uh, the permission to, from that model that I saw at the rainbow sign okay. in order to, okay. to do that. Um, and so I think that the rainbow sign served as a a, a model coming out of the Black Power and Black uh, Arts Movement in the Bay mm -hmm. Area mm -hmm. that influenced a lot of people in the late 70s going into the 1980s. Well, I, I had spent two years with, with Catherine Dunham when I came to, uh, to California. And so I picked it up there, you know, as you know, uh, Molly Fu, she's an uh, incredible, management person, you know, and uh, visionary. But uh, so I'd seen that, you know, essentially, you know, black base, but come on everybody, if you want to see the world through our eyes, although her companies were not, were never exclusively black. Right. As you know. I want to make sure we have time for the audience to ask some questions, but I did also want to ask, one more, um, and Desi, do you have something yeah. to say? No, I, 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 I didn't ask you, I'm just gonna, because we have not talked a little bit about how Bowapa got founded there, and I just wanted to put that out there before yeah, we please. get our questions, but it, please, it, it, does it fit into your question, or should I just go ahead briefly and talk about that? I think you're fine, Dan, or sorry, excuse me, Juan, did you just say we have more time? Yeah, we if, if we need to, we can go to 7.30. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to try to be very brief because I think it goes to what Eugene said, and again, what others have said about how I brought the table was there and said it, everybody was welcome. And as you mentioned, Tessa, and let me first back up because I, I once again want to say thank you, Tessa, for having the dedication and the co commitment to pull this project together and the years you've worked. And Odette, thank you so much for again what you're mm -hmm. sharing to make history possible because it is important for our community and our, and, our, and our folks to know the significance of what the rainbow sign meant and I of course it's a pleasure for me to be along with this esteemed panel and my goodness I'm so again in awe of the work that all of you all are doing but very quickly uh, when Bawapa in 1971 and as you mentioned Tessa early in your overview about uh, half of the, the ladies that she had invited to serve on her kind of, I guess, advisory or policy committee that to help shape things uh, were the original members uh, and founders of the WAPA, uh, certainly led by our, our beloved sister, Edith Austin. And um, Edith uh, called us all together. It was about 12, 13 of us that had been working very hard, starting as you know, in 1968 
to get Ron Dellums elected to Congress. Uh, and we started with, for the city council to the mayor. We, of course, we worked with uh, Warren Widener, who was a mayor. We worked with, you know, just a host of people, but we were such activists, as you say, the black power movement had a present, but there was a part of this a broader picture of the civil rights movement, but that we were all included in that. But there was this group of black women who felt as much as we did along in the spirit of Mary Ann Pollard, that we were not at the table. And when you said that, it was like, you know, we could work for everybody else and we would raise the money, we would raise the dollars and we would hold the events. And, you know, we had all these phenomenal people come to the Rainbow Sign and others, but you know, it was such a significant thing for us that we made sure that black women's voices were heard. And so the rainbow sign was like a perfect place for that. And of course, as we talked about that. So very quickly, I'll sort of end with just this statement. We held our first real open meeting uh, to say, you all come. You know, Edith Austin was the publisher and editor of the Sun Reporter newspaper and had you know, access to that media. And we invited a group of women say, anybody interested in you know, being involved in the political process, join us at the rainbow sign and we would have food and all of this stuff. And, and we expected maybe 30 or 40 people to join us in addition to the uh, 13 of us that were the co-founders. And like I say, close to 300 women showed up at the rainbow sign. So I, you know, it, it showed you again, the, the presence of that place, it was welcoming. People wanted to go there. Mm -hmm. And so that was the genesis of us beginning again to support, train, and elect the many, many women, the faces of women you see now that are in politics, obviously including our uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, who grew up in that segment. So yes. uh, it, I just wanted to not forget and have an opportunity to say we are proud that that was the founding place, really, for Black women organized for political action. Well, WAPA had its roots uh, there with the Dellums campaign and with the rainbow sign. So we applaud you, we thank you, we thank you for her legacy and, and not only her legacy, but again, Henry's legacy of what they created there to make us feel that presence. So thank you. And my parents came to this, I remember them sitting around and talking about creating this thing that ended up being called rainbow sign. But they came by it honestly. By that, I mean, my mom um, used to work for the Urban League. She was interested in politics. So was my dad. I remember a fundraiser at our house for Ron Dellums early on. So there, she came with this knowledge. And, and because she, prior to that for 15 years, was a concert promoter, she understood business. She already had all of the concerts and the performers and what does the contract look like? All of that um, she, she brought to this. And so she took that basis and then said, how can I make it larger, right? How can I make it more inclusive? How can I have a large impact? The thing that I remember, one of the many things I remember most about my mom, of course, was that she had an incredible presence. If she walked into the room, there was no question that she was in the room. There was an absolute power to her. Yes. However, it was not self-aggrandizing at all. It was not, look at mm. me. I mean, you look at my mom as soon as she walked in, into the room. She just exuded power, but she sent it out to other people rather than keeping it saying, look at me appreciate me that's not how she is that power does that make sense no oh, absolutely yeah. and we all and, felt that i think yeah, yeah. And, and 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 we all yes yeah, exactly desi we all felt that we all felt that she had the power but she shared it and she made us uh feel powerful so i would say that marianne was uh a empowerment vehicle right Yes. That, and I think that's what I was trying to say earlier. You know, yeah, you that's a good description of my dad too. Mm -hmm. Right, because yeah. it was the two of them because oh. that helped my mom do that. My dad went, yeah, you can be the face of this, that, no problem. But he was there through right. it all. And, yeah. and believe me, decision. and believe me, that's a special black man, <laughs> especially at that time that can do that. Yeah, in the 50s, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's okay for okay. you to be out there. Khalifa is still a special man. <laughs> I know, I have one. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's still a special one. I have one. Well, you know, you know I wanted to, to just add that she could also 
go somewhere and whatever you saw when you walked saw her in you know in the rainbow sign she would cover that she could mix in when she went to some event to appreciate somebody else and i remember getting an award at cal state sacramento <clears throat> and uh it, uh, it was a teaching and research award. And so the teachers had to come and hear me. It was an annual award and money was involved. And so, uh, you know, I was introduced and I started to give my lecture and I looked at an audience and it was Mary Ann sitting and, you know, she hadn't told me she was coming to Sacramento. She got an invitation or read it in the paper. And there she was in Sacramento. And I, I just, I was so happy, you know, because I just used to coming to, I was like coming to her, coming, you know, coming to her because she, you know, that's right, where everything right. was. And uh, and I, 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 I saw that other times in other ways with other people. So uh, she yeah. got out and enjoyed being a, a member of the audience uh, at times also. And, you yeah. know, we're saying that she, that, that she had a full-time job now <laughs> while she was doing all this. <laughs> Tessa? And, and, and I would go, I would go, I would visit Mary Ann and, and Henry at other times and other people, the people who did the rainbow sign thing didn't know it. I was just driving and talk, and, you know, it's almost like laying my head on her shoulder in her lap and get, getting some wisdom. Because I was a 30 something professor because of the movement, uh, a lot happened speedily. So I became a full professor at like 31. I want to ask know, because the movement yeah. was doing that for, her. and so a lot of a lot of stuff was coming at me real fast, and I would just do it with her like I used to do with Catherine Dunham. I would just go and sit with her yeah. and ask her, you know, how do you handle this? How do I handle that? You know? Yeah. I want to ask about um, one last question about. What does rainbow sign have to teach us today? What is different about our moment here and now? And, uh, you know, we also haven't mentioned uh, Kamala Harris wrote about how important rainbow sign was to her yeah. as, yeah. As, a, as a young girl. But, um, but I want to, I want to think about what sort of teaching moments there are. Well, I, I think, let me, let me just jump in real quick. I, I, I think there's so many lessons there, but I think as we were, I think all of us have incorporated that already in, I think it, it was such a profound lesson of one, the acumen of how, you know, Henry and Maria worked together to have a vision to create a place where they could bring and unite a, a community together. And, you know, what I say to young people today as we're out here, we so appreciate what's going on in our community with, again, Black Lives Matter, you know, the Wapas and the hundreds of mm. other uh, organizations out there trying to make change in our community mm -hmm. is that we interface with each other and it's not we should not be in, in competition but we should work together and respect and appreciate our uh, different approaches but to understand that we're all coming from a unified place of trying to make uh, to solve the critical uh, uh, crisis in our country and so when we started in the civil rights movement and we, you know, those of us that were back there in the 60s, included even the John Lewis's and, and again, all of those folks that we were the Julian Bonds and, and many of them who I was blessed to have the pleasure to work with, we were mm -hmm. standing on the shoulders who came from, the, uh, from people before us. There are young people now standing on the shoulders of the work that people in the civil rights movement did. What mm -hmm. Mary Ann Paula and Henry Paula did is that again, they created a place where people could feel united to come and have cross discussions, have an intersection of planning and strategic. That is something that we continue to need to have to do today. People mm -hmm. like Kamala, as I said, who clearly has mentioned that publicly, 
that that influencer, that culture, that that environment of integrating and mixing up with people like that, the community leaders, the activists, the you know the, the those uh, uh, talent, all that collection of talent, help to influence her activism, help to in her commitment, her compassion to help others, and that has a lot to do with the place and the space that. Odetta, uh, Odetta, I'm sorry, Marianne, I'm looking at Odetta saying thank you, but <laughs> Marianne and Henry created. So uh, it's, it, they clearly had a profound influence on what we need to do today and how we should continue that forward. Yeah, I think that um, each generation needs to see institutions that are run by Black people who are in charge, who can um, show that a kind of compassion for what each generation needs in terms of a community unifying process. I think that uh, each generation needs to see that we have um, thoughtful, uh, caring elders who can really galvanize the next generation to keep the mm -hmm. struggle going. Mm -hmm. And that is what the rainbow sign um, was doing in the 70s. And uh, obviously the, the need is still there. It's even more important today with mm -hmm. all this um, fascist kind of uh, right wing um, yeah. uh, thrust that we have in this country today because uh, the, 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 the Kamala Harris's who were nurtured by the rainbow sign are now in major positions of power. Precisely. And the powers that be really don't want to see that. They really don't want to see a, a Kamala Harris as the, the yeah, next yeah, line yeah, to the president yeah. of the United States. They do not want to see the, uh, the Stacey Abrams and the Latasha Browns of our day who are getting Black people for the first time to vote and take power in this country. And so... Um, and it's, by the way, it's not the first time. I, I just about to Of course it's not. But, but it's, it's, they're recognizing it and seeing it. But we have been yeah. doing that for years, especially African-American women, I have to say that, have consistently been the backbone of this party just haven't been recognized, but they're bringing a yeah. face. Right. And so, and so all, all I'm saying, uh, Desi, is that um, the rainbow sign was what was that kind of model. Absolutely. Continually yeah. Made yeah. Oh, yeah. for each yeah. generation. Did you did you see that um, that Stacey Abrams and Barbara Lee have been nominated for a Nobel Prize? Uh, no, I hadn't. But great, they need to be. <laughs> yes, just now. And oh, Wonderful. great, they need. And, and I wanted to say um, to Odetta and Tessa and others, well, all of them, that maybe given uh, uh, Kamala Harris's reflections on you know on on rainbow sign, it may be <clears throat> a wonderful um, documentary that you did can be enhanced, uh, you know, and in, into a into a you know a more refined. Not that that's not not a good one, but something with, uh, with, with a very professional you know thrust, mm -hmm. and have Kamala Harris you know get behind it. Fair enough. Uh, Tessa, did you, <laughs> did you did you say Tessa that you have some people calling in? Well, so we have you know lots of people listening, and I and I do want to open up the chat or the Q and A right now. If there's questions that you have for our panelists, um, and you'd like to write them, I can read them aloud. Um, so, and I think there's a few things that were mentioned already. I didn't have a chance to answer. Um, some criticism of me. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Let's oh see. yeah, question that came in. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, she's looking. She's looking right now. Yes. Yeah, I'm looking at it now too. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Oh, there, of course, I think you you there, weren't. I don't think you were born when the uh, rainbow sign rained, right? I was not. Yeah, because I have I, I have a bunch of students who. I'll start off. I'm, I'm going to try to be quiet. I know you want to get a few questions in before we start off. So maybe we can speak less and let you ask the questions and answer them as briefly as we can. And I'll volunteer to do to honor that. Okay, me too. Um, so there's a couple little technical questions. Juan, maybe you can ask this. People want to know where they'll be able to see the recording of this. 
Uh, it'll be available on uh, YouTube. Okay, and that'll be oh, through there. Library's YouTube, Ber Berkeley Public Library, YouTube. So, so perhaps they can uh, check uh, periodically on the Berkeley Public Library website to find out. Yeah, and that should all be tagged okay. with rainbow sign or the Taria Hall Pittman, things like right. that, if you want to search for it. Can, can we get a copy of it? Surely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, no okay. problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so some folks want to know if there is a plaque on the building and if the building still exists. Um, yes. I can answer that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You take it, Odette. I can answer that. Yes, the building does ex exist at 2640 Grove Street. I still refer to it as Grove Street. You would know it as MLK. Uh, there is not a plaque yet, but there can be. Okay. I, I think it would be great to have that, you know, so that uh, it will be a commemoration for future generations that that organization existed there and it has a, a major history. We'll definitely well, look I, into I, that. I volunteer to make a donation to, to the plaque fund. Fair enough. Thank you, Eugene. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get that. I'll get the information. Awesome. That's another question. Uh, people want to know if the, what the building is now. It is now the site of Berkeley Mental Health Services. So it's an interesting trajectory. Started yeah. the funeral yeah. home. It was rainbow sign, and now it is mental health services. Yeah. So, uh, speaks yeah. yeah that, that's a, somehow so, some poet has got to make some connection between those. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and you, you <laughs> should. You like should. That. And I'm sure we all heard stories when, when you told when you told someone it was formerly a funeral home. You know, yeah. were people who who literally didn't want to go. You know, had to be dragged there because they, you know, because of their belief, religious belief, or mm -hmm. the superstitions and so on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I remember Electra Price saying that people especially <laughs> took issue with there being a restaurant there like that. That was you know, yeah, they, yeah. Nobody, yeah, they got yeah. it, or they didn't. Um, okay, we have a question. Who is carrying this torch now in Berkeley? What torch would that be? Uh, it doesn't say in the chat. Um, I guess- The rainbow sign torch? I mean, do they mean the activism again, or again, as, as you just said, or they talk about, is there something similar? To uh, what the rainbow sign was. I'm not, you know, it's, it, the question is kind of broad and it's kind of hard because there are obviously a number of organizations and groups that are still moving in the direction of, of, of social and, 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 and criminal justice uh, change, uh, uh, certainly in the performing arts. There are just a number of things going on. And so it's kind of hard to answer that. And certainly, if, if maybe people could come offline or give us more specific. Some of us may be able through you, uh, Tessa, to kind of give them more information as they, as they require. Certainly. So it's an anonymous person who asked that. Um, if you're still with us um, and you want to get a little more specific about what you mean, um, type that in the chat. That would be great. Um, and well, you know, they, um, the, the, enough, you know, I think, it, Eugene, excuse me. I, th I think Tessa's getting ready to read another question. Oh, OK. OK. Oh. Um, well, there's a question that I don't entirely understand, which is what was the folding of the rainbow sign? I guess that means how did it close? Um, and that is because of money. And, um, you know, we didn't talk about it during the, the slideshow, but it was arranged on a membership model because of where it was, because it was in a residential neighborhood to get the license to do it, they had to build it as a membership club. Um, and uh, part of that meant that you had to get a whole lot of people who were uh, able to pay some dues every year. And in the punishing recession of the mid 1970s, that became less and less possible for folks. Um, people might want to show up to see a concert or an art show, but it was a hard sell to get them to want to pay money every month to sustain something. Um, and then, yeah, raising rent prices, um, things like that. And it just became unfortunately uh, impossible to sustain. So, uh, Let's see if that person wrote back. We have, uh, yes, thank you. This, how did it end? Um, we have a comment, um, someone who talked about the play, Look What a Wonder, which happened towards the end of <laughs> Rainbow Sign. Um, and it featured Odetta, the folk singer. She was, um, and I want everyone to know as well, um, if you have more questions or things that 
you would like to stories you would like to share i started a, a gmail account which is rainbow sign berkeley at gmail.com i would love uh, if you want to write me and, and share those um, to add towards this this record um, but to go back to this comment um, I was the publicist for the show and worked with Milton Tuitt, who is the graphic artist who developed the logo for the show. I remember really wonderful events at the Rainbow Sign, like a reception for the sculptor artist Barbara Chase Ribaud, Ribaud that we organized because the Berkeley Art Museum did not organize a reception for Miss Ribaud. I don't know how to say it, I'm sorry. Uh, we were appalled that Barbara did not get the kind of reception for her incredible art. I especially love the art exhibits at Rainbow Sign. I purchased two wonderful pieces by Rosalind Jeffries, who later worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and was married to Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who is the chair of the African American Studies Department at City College. Also, I remember Max Roach performing at Rainbow Sign after he had been at an artist retreat in Marin. The concert was mm. surprising and so impromptu. Thank you so much for sharing that. We did not have that artist or no. musician, um, but that was also part of the thing, right? There was, this is pre-internet. So there was all kinds of impromptu stuff happening. And how do you get the word out? You're like, oh, hey, I mean, I remember hearing that the, um, the Josephine Baker thing, you know, it was like yeah. last minute, like, oh, hey, she's gonna be here. Can we get her? Great we can get her can we tell everyone like how do you do that um so the mechanisms of that and also i remember uh, charles brown talking about you know i think it was him about the after party that happened at rambo sign things going mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. there's a concert somewhere else and all the jazz music it was a, actually it was an interview of Marianne Pollard where she was talking about it all the the jazz musicians would uh would just show up and play into the into the wee hours of the night and uh if if you were in the know you yeah, were at rambo yeah. sign but yeah you no know, you know it just mm -hmm. happened and there wasn't a flyer for it yeah yeah there were always after parties even after concerts right Right, and and I I think that uh, Marianne had a, a a real sixth sense about um, artistry itself. Like she, uh, e even if you didn't have a name, she could tell if you really knew what you were doing and that you had something to say. And yeah. she took a chance on you. Um, so that that kind of vi uh, vision that uh, a good producer has for what is the next stage? What is the next uh, vision in, in, in particular art forms? Marianne definitely had that. So I, I'm not surprised that she gave people chances who didn't really have a name at that time, but uh, later went on to great fame. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is there any other questions people would like to throw in the chat? Well, Tessa, if not while you're looking for that, uh, I'm going to have to jump off in a little bit. I've got uh, people already here waiting. As I said, I thought we would be done by 7, but it's 7.15. But I can't tell you just in closing what a pleasure, again, it has been to uh, be with my friend, Halifo, and, and the, the, Eugene. It's so good to see you and hear all yeah. of your course of dad and Tessa. And, you know, again, what a wonderful project. I hope we continue to... Uh, make sure, and I certainly don't want to say, I think it's such a great idea that if there's any way a WAMPA can help uh, create an atmosphere to say we need to have a permanent uh, plaque or honor for the rainbow sign in Berkeley, uh, we could certainly have our chapters help to um, submit that kind of proposal to the appropriate bodies, including the city councils and whatever, because that's what we do. And we can okay. ask you to say, yeah. uh, let's Thank you. do Great. that uh, Great. in that honor. Because we want to, again, it's so important that, again, not just us folks that have been around a long time remember that history, but that that history is there uh, for others to pass by. And even if they come by and see, my goodness, what was the rainbow sign? And who was that a youngster might be inquisitive enough like Tessa to explore that. So we'll be glad to work on with someone I don't want to, I can't volunteer my executive director staff to lead it, but we certainly know how to advocate for it. And so if we could have a conversation offline, whoever wants to work with that, we'll be glad to work with you on that project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, we love it. And my goodness, you all, will you forgive me for jumping off? I think you've had most of your calls. Am I okay to? Um, absolutely. Yeah. We're through, right? Fine. Okay. Well, thank you. But thank I you. All right. Thank all right. Bye, Thank you. Nice to see you. Love you all and uh, have a great remaining year. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be one. Yeah. Um, 
2021 has has to be on the upswing from 2020. <laughs> you know, you know. Absolutely. Thank okay. you. Okay. Good night, everybody. And thank you again, Tessa. Bye. And and and, and yes, the, yes, the Tessa. Thank library you. Library and Odette. Odette. Nice, nice to talk to you. I'll talk to you all later. Oh yes, okay. please stay in touch. Okay. Of course, let's do. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Tessa, thank you for this. Thank you. Um, Juan, I think you had a couple things to let people know about before we yeah. close the meeting. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, thank the panelists. Thank you, Tessa. And um, as well as Scott Sow and Gregory Castile. And I uh, hope you guys can join us for our next events in the series in partnership with Revolution, Berkeley Revolution. Uh, including talks on the disability rights movement and the Pacific Center. Um, we'll announce the date and time soon on those on the library social media website. And I hope that you'll take the time to fill out a survey, which you'll receive soon. And uh, good night. Real quickly, um, uh, uh, um, Electra, you know, she wanted to be here. I mean, she wanted to join us, but a couple of things that she that stood out, uh, memories of Marianne. She said that she spoke Spanish fluently. Yes. And that she was a gourmet cook and prepared a lot of Correct. Good so she wanted me to share that. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she was um, both of those things. I also want to mention um, just one last thing from the chat. The the lovely comment uh, about Max Roach and the other artists was from a woman named Valerie Bradley. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ah, wonderful. All right. Thank you, Valerie. Well, thank you again, Tessa. Thank you, Odette. And thank you. Have good thank you and good night. Good night. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Uh-huh. Bye.